All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Prime Time at the Bethel University Library. Prime Time is a collaborative program between the Friends of the Bethel University Library, Academic Affairs, and other offices on campus that brings you programming that celebrates learning in and beyond the classroom of Bethel faculty, students, and staff. We're so glad you've joined us. Join us on Tuesday, April 12th, when students in the Pietas Honors Program will present the scholarship and service projects that they completed as part of the program. And now I'd like to turn things over to Ken Steinbach. I have one. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Ray. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. This is uh, really fun to see faces and to have this conversation about this, uh, you know, this artwork that Josh has been working on, um, you know, was working on last semester. So um, today uh, is my, my privilege, my honor, you know, to kind of do a, a bit of an introduction uh, for our two other panelists. You know, for myself, my name is Ken Steinbach. I teach sculpture here uh, down in the art department been here for a while and, and seen a lot of students come and go. And it's always really fun when you have someone like Josh who is uh, reaching big and, you know, sort of going after some pretty fun ideas to uh, participate in forums like this, which sort of offer extra opportunities. So um, Josh Vanna is our one of our speakers today, the, the artist and one of our main speakers today. Uh, he's a Bethel University um, senior art major. Are you, you're, what's that? You're junior? I thought you told me you were senior. Okay, all right. <laughs> we can argue about that later. So, are you also like a double major too? Just a minor graphic design. Okay. Um, maybe what I would say about Josh in a, in a less formal way, uh, he is a participant in formal and informal art exhibits on campus. Uh, he's well known among art department faculty for his contagious enthusiasm, you could say, uh, in the classroom and his willingness to delve deeply into the projects he's developing. Uh, you will no doubt experience some of that contagious enthusiasm today. So, throughout his time here, Josh has had an interest in figurative and representational art, um, often working in larger scales and in a manner that I think has roots in European Romantic era. It's a conversation that he and I have had a long time. Um, toward the end of his talk, Josh will take some questions about the work and the process. Uh, and while not wanting to steal his thunder, um, I do think it is helpful at the outset of our talk to briefly, out briefly outline some of the framework of the project, um, just to kind of give you a, a bit of an intro to that. So the, the project that you're looking at uh, emerged from an independent study that Josh did. He actually approached me. Uh, the class he wanted to take was not available. And in his, uh, maybe I would say, persistent enthusiasm, um, he was not willing to not make sculpture. And so he uh, pitched the idea of an independent study, and we worked that out. Um, and in terms of the independent study, as we negotiated that, uh, there were a couple parts of that. And the thing that you're seeing sort of behind you over here, the larger sculpture, that was really just one element of the overall project. Uh, second element of the project was actually negotiating the work within, you know, putting into the community here at Bethel University. Um, I can tell you from experience, what you never want to do with a public artwork is to plunk it in the middle of the community and walk away. You have to do a lot of work in order to make the things happen. Everything from being pragmatic, you know, dealing with fact man and administration and stuff like that, to um, also creating some of the documents and things that go into that. So that was the, the second part of that. Uh, and then the third part of the research that he, the third part of the project was actually the research that he did that he's presenting today, which is the historical roots of dragon imagery, both in Eastern and Western art. So there are three parts of that. And then I'll stop and I'll let you talk about all your fun stuff. So, okay, no, wait. I guess we've got to talk about Jim. <laughs> <laughs> You're enthusiastic. So. Mm -hmm. Um, saying that adventure is in my genes, Dr. Jim Lewis has led weekend college trips on Holy Land tours and taken several Bethel University groups to Thailand, as well as other study groups through China, Malaysia, and Vietnam. A former missionary to Vietnam and teacher in India, he has returned to Vietnam to present papers on Hmong culture and society at Hanoi's National University. He's also the co-author of the book, Religious Traditions of the World, and has also written on the Jains of India, as well as other similar topics. Uh, Dr. Lewis speaks Vietnamese. And as we can see in his presentation, he's also well-versed in the language of visual art, which at times acts like a bit of a, a different language altogether. He brings to this study a deep appreciation and knowledge for Asian culture and traditions that he has cultivated over a long career. 
We're so glad to have him here today to offer his perspective uh, on the subject. Um, an avid trout fisherman, uh, Jim also claims um, to have caught a 27 inch walleye on Mille Lacs Lake. So, um, <laughs> whether this is true or not, <laughs> just the fact that he claims this uh, clearly establishes his bona fides as a uh, Minnesotan. So. <laughs> Um, Dr. Lewis, uh, more on point here, Dr. Lewis has also taught classes on Asian art for us here in the art department. So, uh, so we'll hear from Josh first and then Jim will talk a bit and then uh, looking forward to a conversation because this really was billed as a conversation uh, at the end. We'd love to hear some questions from you folks and we'll talk a little bit more um, and then take some questions from you. So, all right, Josh. Okay, hi everyone. So my name, like Ken uh, lovely introduced me, uh, is Josh Fanna. And uh, yeah, I uh, am so blessed to be here. And I would just like to say thank you for everyone for coming out. Um, and uh, I would also like to say just a few thank yous before we get rolling. Um, so first I would like to thank the, the library staff for approving this work. Uh, it was sort of like, hey, I have this idea, and they were like, okay, yeah, yeah, I like it. And then they were like, you could go bigger. And I was like, okay, sounds good. <laughs> so uh, the initial proposal for this project was two feet shorter than it was, but they were like, hey, you have the space. We're gonna we're gonna set everything up for you. And I was like, okay. So I went down to the studio, and this is what happened. Um, but yeah. Thank you for approving this work and just supporting me and being willing to work here. And then um, just approaching me about the prime time and asking me to talk. The support has been amazing. Um, a special thank out to Ann Gannon, uh, who made sure that I was organized, which is not a small task. <laughs> yeah, she took care of all the logistics of the installation um, and the information of the poacher at test attached to the prime time topic. And then also a thank you to Jim Lewis for being such a wealth of information, just so knowledgeable on the topic and the things that he knows and agreeing to participate in this presentation. And then to Ken, uh, who agreed to an independent study with this kid obsessed with dragons. <laughs> thank you for letting me take over 20 square feet of the art studio um, for the creation of this project. And then also a thank you to the administration and the fact man who I approached earlier about the logistics of putting a sculpture up and the safety concerns. And then to the many people I came to for advice and offering uh, and offered their support to me. So why in the world dragons? Glad you asked. <laughs> so taking a trip into my childhood, our family had recently painted the house and with painting the house, you get painting sticks. The only thing cooler, um, well, the, the coolest thing for like middle school boys is like swords. So we taped these things up and we had splinters all throughout the house because we were fighting with them. Um, and so because that's a safety concern, my mom got us actual swords, you know, much safer. <laughs> yeah, plastic though, not metal. So, um, uh, yeah, so we just kind of latched onto this medieval era and it was really me who was like, this is cool. So my mom humored it and she took us um, to Renaissance fairs and we were just like the cultural, the imagery where we're like, oh my gosh, like jousting, like fighting combat. We're like, yes, this is so cool. Um, but the one thing that was missing was dragons. You know, there's a lot of imagery there, but there's not so much. They couldn't exactly bring a dragon to the Renaissance fair as my mom explained. <laughs> Um, yeah, so why, why should you care? Um, dragons have such a presence about them. Um, there's such a dynamic narrative element, and this shows up in the media, and we notice. So the symbols are everywhere. A couple examples are churches, the Bible, and most notably, uh, not most notably, but also noted is movies. So the answer is a little bit complicated. Um, this means we have to trace dragons back to their origin. How do we do this? To 
quote J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, the author of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, probably one of the biggest um, fantic, uh, fantastical works out there. Um, this is what he said. I believe that legend and myth are largely made of truth. So let's find ourselves a legend. The one I picked was actually a story I knew quite well. Margaret Hodge. I had this exact book growing up, and I think it's the only book to this day that I have read 30 times. <laughs> um, regardless, you all know the story, right? There's a peaceful town. The life is upset by a dragon who has come to terrorize the land. And there's a maiden who is in need of rescuing. Um, she's saved. The dragon is slain. The town is freed by a knight. Well, that's not actually it. You see, George was actually a third century Roman, or a third, yeah, third century Roman. Um, he was a soldier in the Roman army who was martyred for refusing to give up his Christian faith. And he achieved the status of saint. But then the legend of St. George slaying the dragon originated in the 11th century. Why is there a gap there? That's a huge amount of time. Um, it's the incorporation of pagan ideals and British influence. The oldest known record originates from Georgia, the country, not the state. <laughs> uh, slaying the dragon is found in a Gregorian text or Georgian text, sorry, in the 11th century. This is the oldest record that we have of the legend. There's actually just a fun fact. There's like a third of the churches there are all like named after St. George. And like, it's like festivals there, like George, he's kind of a big deal there. Uh, anyway, so uh, once we get uh, in the 12th century, the story gets spread around via the Crusades. So 12th century now, just one more century away, uh, we've got the Crusades. Now the Crusades happen, so George is here, Crusades start here and they kind of spread around this way, right? Uh, uh, spread via the Crusades. And then once it hits the 13th century, the story is recorded in the book known as the Golden Legend, uh, Leg Legenda Centorium, the reading of the saints. This means that the work becomes canonized into a popular book at the time. And that happened right around here in Italy and then a little bit in Libya that they were collecting the stories. So how do you make an already popular book explode? Uh, early 15th century, there's the invention of the printing press. Um, yeah, in the, in the printing, they published it in Latin and every major European language. And before the 1500s, there was, there was more editions than the Bible. So, what is the Golden Legend? Um, I'm glad, uh, permit me a brief retelling of the Golden Legend. So, this is like the foreshortened version that's actually much longer. But, he suddenly comes upon a maiden who tells him that a dragon which infects the land has devoured all the cattle and the sons and the daughters of the inhabitants in payment of tribute. Now the lot had fallen upon her, the king's daughter, to share the same fate at once, he champions her cause, overcomes the dragon, binds him with the maiden's girdle, and leads him to captivity in the city. There's much joy, and all the inhabitants accept the Christian faith. <laughs> um, oh, excuse me. So actually, uh, he's absolutely killing it as a missionary. And <laughs> there's just a couple of major themes I would like to note in this story. So the sacrificing of something other to God um, the land and the people being held captive can be used to portray any Old Testament story about God's promise to the people using a judge and a savior to set them free from their captivity. And then looking at the chivalry ideas present, it can be assumed that if a maiden needed rescuing, the person, thing, or place is probably evil. In a Christian context, rescuing the maiden is a direct redemptive act of Christ. And then the golden legend was actually used as a record of sermon material. Pastors would use these stories as intros or themes because people couldn't read. They were 
they were taught by the preacher who had an academic understanding, and so he would use stories that stuck in their mind. And obviously it worked. Um, going back to the map, we said Italy, and really everywhere else around here was impacted by the Crusades. Well, what also happens in Italy uh, is the Renaissance. And the Renaissance people pick up on these very visually thematic uh, ideas and they just bring it to life. So uh, this is the work by Paolo Uccello. And as we can see, it's St. George and the Dragon, kind of just as it's depicted. We've got a maiden, a dragon, the dragon's abode, um, some greenery in the background, and then we've got the valiant knights come to her rescue. So you notice that even though the beast is thought of as a huge monster, like we're like, oh my gosh, it's massive. Compositionally, it's much smaller, so it can fit in with the rest of the painting. Uh, Uchi, uh, Paolo's big thing was perspective, and you can see that in the way that he has arranged this work. But if we notice right up here, that's a storm cloud and it represents, um, it's perfectly aligned with the spear and it it's, if we see here, this is like a triangle and it points right here. The storm is actually um, a, represent a representation of divine intervention. Um, and this happens everywhere. People are using this imagery this work here is done by Raphael. Um, and then that's, that's in the 1500s. And then we have a resubmergence around the 18th century where Gustave Moret um, in the symbolist movement is reincorporating that imagery um, and making use of its powerful, powerful uh, image. So the church is on a mission to convert the pagans. It ends up embracing dragons and using them as the physical embodiment of sin or the reincarnation of Satan. Um, in this way, the church melds ideas of chivalry and Christianity. Yeah. This, brief, uh, this brings me to a brief uh, anatomical comparison of the Western versus the Eastern. So the Western dragon is basically the apex predator. You know, it's like, a, it's bigger than a bear with deer-like horns and talons like an eagle. It's basically a really scary lion and an alligator, and it's given wings. <laughs> Not something you'd want to run into. This is opposed to the Eastern one. So yeah, that's the Western. This is opposed to the Eastern one. Um, the Eastern one in regard to form has more of a snake-like body with arms and legs, brightly colored body, elements of nature like rains or clouds. So commonly when it's depicted, it's floating, it's very airy. You can see how it's, it's not existing on the ground versus this one, which is like it's concrete, it's evil, it's menacing. Look at how sharp that is versus the more flowy nature. Um, in Chinese culture, there is a need for water to keep their crops healthy, yet they hold the fear of floods. This is the original location of the ying yang. Um, their staple crops in their culture being millet and rice depended on sufficient rain to have a good f harvest, but feared the event of a flood. What arose from those needs and fears was having a something that could make rain and control the floods. This something was connected with the presence and symbolism of animals. Thus, dragons in this culture became a personification of nature's might. In the culture, they used, um, because they're deeply agricultural, uh, the dragon looks like a combination of many different animals due to that personification of nature. So, uh, this dragon was also for them an association of the divine, and it's um, embodied in their in their architecture, in their textiles. It's basically ingrained in their culture. So, uh, like St. George, I wanted a specific myth that I could locate and track down. And so I looked at the Azure Dragon, um, which is one of the main guardian spirits. And the myths associated with this dragon is that uh, human heroes, when they died, they got re 
incarnated as the spirit of this dragon, or if they were going to battle, they got uh, personified as this dragon, as this mighty warrior force that had come to save the people. And so it's one of the, the main guardian spirits, but it's typically portrayed with the white tiger, the black tortoise, and the Demonian bird. And it's positioned with the directions. So the dragon is uh, the east. Yeah. So this is a piece um, on a tomb wall of a noble, of a noble's grave. And this is the east, the east wall in the seventh century. And it's interesting to see because it's like a square space. The, the sky is like the constellation. And then the east wall is, um, is this dragon. And then the other three sides are the white tiger, the black tortoise, and the vermilion bird. It's like these four, these four animals are the guardian spirits that they make use of. So another work that I looked at was this was a sarcophagus that people, they were actually trying to plant a field and they like accidentally knocked into this temple that was underground. And so they brought in, um, they brought in one of their saints or one of their holy men to just like ask the spirits to forgive them for making this gravest mistake, but also to bless them as they uncover and relocate this piece. So this is also on the east side of the sarcophagus. And on the other sides, there's the four animals, and on the top, there's a small inscription about the person who was inside, a noble. Uh, yeah, and this is dated to the, around 200 AD. And now going into our Eastern culture more, because I have a very limited knowledge, I would like to welcome Jim Lewis. Well, uh, thank you, Josh, and thanks to Ken <clears throat> together who have invited me to uh, participate in, uh, in this, which is a real joy for me. And uh, I, when I first saw the dragon in the library, I, I was just stunned, as so many of us were, and have uh, enjoyed uh, thinking about it, writing about it a little bit. And let me take a, a few minutes here uh, to pick up from where Josh has left off and uh, talk about the dragon motif uh, as it uh, finds its origin <clears throat> and meaning in uh, China. So uh, the dragon motif uh, first came to light uh, both in China and for the world uh, in the late 19th century and into the 20th. There was a, a Swedish archaeologist on the ground when one of these uh, tombs uh, was um, interrupted by construction or whatever it was, and uh, they were just stunned at what they found. Uh, included in these tombs were uh, jade objects, highly crafted and incised, and then there were these bronze vases, which um, many of which had uh, images that were perplexing and uh, very finely done. And so this was this was in the heartland of Chinese culture uh, at the great bend of the Yellow River in not too far from the present day city of Xi'an. Some of you have probably been to Xi'an. And, uh, and uh, what stunned uh, Carl Grun and uh, scholars, uh, art historians, uh, every sense uh, is the extreme uh, craftsmanship of these bronze vases. So we're going to see in a, in a moment, uh, here's uh, one of these vases. I think uh, I took this picture at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, which uh, had a collection on view in, uh, I think, in the Asian gallery. Recently, these uh, have been uh, removed from view because uh, officials from the People's Republic of China are re, uh, kind of negotiating over the return 
of these vases to to China, which uh, we are seeing that take place in a, a number of different settings. But anyway, <clears throat> um, uh, so uh, in addition to the curious uh, mask-like appearance that is on these vases, which were used to uh, store uh, uh, at different shapes, uh, probably 20 or 30 different kinds of shapes. Some uh, uh, held water, some held wine, some, some held rice, other food goods uh, that were then placed in the tomb for the use of the ancestors in the afterlife. And so uh, the Shang bronze vases going back to uh, 15th century BC uh, were an affirmation uh, on the part of uh, the elite of Chinese society, belief in immortality. And uh, no society has had a greater investment in the idea of ancestor worship or ancestor veneration than the Chinese. So uh, <clears throat> here we are uh, in the early part of the 20th century, look, looking back on artwork that was created uh, in the 15th century BC, 15th uh, down to the 10th, and actually beyond, although the quality of the uh, bronze vases uh, deteriorates a little bit in, as you move into the Zhou and the later Zhou period. So um, <clears throat> um, you, we have the dragon motif, but uh, in addition, although not seen so well here, uh, in various places on these vases, kind of the background or side spaces, uh, there was a, uh, a spiral square uh, in order to fill in that space and to give uh, uh, beauty to it that stunned uh, the, the artists because they were uh, 1 32nd of, a, uh, of an inch in width or less and uh, three sixty-fourths of an inch in depth and could only really be appreciated under a hand lens or a microscope. And these, uh, these uh, shapes and the, the, uh, the incision was not V-shaped, but it was trough-shaped. So that at the corners, perfectly vertical uh, from uh, side to, to vertical and so on. So um, uh, the but the main uh, the main show was this what is called the Tao Tia, and I have a few um, examples uh, on a handout. I, yeah. So uh, and uh, 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 it's as though that there it's it's a question of whether it is a mask or a, which it, or, or a creature that has been splayed and depicted around the surface of of the vase. Uh, here uh, you would see uh, the horn uh, right and left, uh, the tail and so on, uh, the uh, the beak or the fang, the upper jaw, and so on, and of course the eyes. So with some imagination, <clears throat> you can uh, be duly, duly frightened. Uh, and maybe not, you don't need too much imagination, but it's believed that uh, this is really the, uh, the origin, at least in the Chinese setting, of the idea of the, of the dragon. So down through the uh, centuries in Chinese art, literature, uh, text, legend, myth, the, the dragon has appeared uh, in multiple places in multiple ways. Uh, here's a picture of um, the, um, in front of the uh, Gate of Supreme Harmony in the Forbidden City of Beijing. No longer forbidden, you know there's only one forbidden city today left of all the forbidden cities. Uh, it's, this, is a, this is a quiz question for my students. Uh, and that would be in Mecca. So, uh, and uh, here in the Esplanade, uh, you have the, the carving. I believe this is, uh, is uh, marble. And over here is the same. 
and uh, so very much present in the uh, art, the art architecture, decorative arts of China, not to speak about its place in uh, literature uh, and text, which I should make a, a comment about here uh, after we look at this. So here is the esplanade, the stairway um, upward to the uh, Hall of Great Harmony. And on the left is a detail of what we have here on the, on the right. And you can see many of the features um, of uh, Joshua's uh, uh, dragon here, I believe. And in fact, <clears throat> it seems to me that this is a, uh, a Chinese dragon. Uh, and uh, so that's why I was so pleased. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, talking about, talking about uh, say, text, and dragons and text in, in uh, China, <clears throat> um, the, the dragon uh, has essentially positive uh, uh, appreciation in, in China. Uh, it is the yang of the yin-yang pairing. Uh, and as uh, Josh has said, associated with ease, associated with water, uh, and with fertility. Uh, and uh, Yang, um, or the dragon, has its counterpart, Yin, which was the phoenix. And so in some of the vestments, uh, uh, females, especially of the nobility or the imperial family, the crest on the vestment of the male would be the dragon, and the crest uh, or medallion uh, on female vestments would, would be the phoenix. I have a couple of paintings at home that uh, depict that. <laughs> um, so uh, just to talk a little bit more about art and text, in, <clears throat> in China, uh, we have the art first and we have the text later. We don't have the reference to the dragon and its significance or incorporation in literature, um, to my knowledge, uh, until the Taoist literature comes, comes out. It is incorporated uh, indirectly in Confucian literature, but in the Taoist literature it is found. So you have art first and you have a text later. In the Indian setting, just to move over there just very briefly, <clears throat> it's flipped. So the earliest reference to dragons is in the Vedic literature, specifically the Rig Veda. Rig Vedic uh, texts are dated between 1500 and 1200. And in the, um, in the Rig Veda, which uh, early on in that period, which parallels the, the Shang Bronze, uh, or the Shang Dynasty, early on in that period, <coughs> uh, a demon uh, dragon is uh, slain by one of the most prominent of the uh, Rigvedic uh, deities, which was Indra. Indra was the god of storm. And uh, the, the dragon had coiled itself around the mountain, preventing water from moving down out of the mountains and into the lowlands, just like the Himalayas today. The water's coming out of the Himalayas, coming down into uh, the kind of Gangetic plain. Well, anyway, Indra kills the dragon, removes his uh, restriction, his constricting uh, activity on the mountain so that water and fertility can continue. So it's kind of interesting to me how that the Indian and the Chinese mythology uh, is, uh, it can be compared and seen. And more can be said, especially as you move over into Persia, where that there is a dragon in the Zoroastrian literature, the Avesta, and so on. It takes me too far, far, too far away. <laughs> now, uh, now, just to look at the dragon image right here in Roseville, Minnesota. Uh, uh, the point to be made here is that uh, the dragon imagery and significance predated either the Taoist, the Confucian, or the Buddhist uh, traditions in India, but uploaded into it and used impress, in impressive ways, as you see here. So the dragon um, uh, has its uh, marvelous representation right here at the uh, Roseville uh, Buddhist, Vietnamese Buddhist temple. And uh, I was hoping that I might get uh, 
my friend uh, uh, Han Kien to come, the monk there, but he was un unable to come today. Uh, so, yeah, we're all acquainted with how the dragon is uh, part of the finials of roof lines. Uh, this one I took in, in Beijing <clears throat> and uh, in, in the vestments and, and so on. So uh, just this much about uh, some input into Josh's wonderful work and explanation about the dragon. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, you know, I think, so, you know, take, uh, maybe I would just offer a couple of observations. You know, this is more a talk about historical perspective, and I'm really very happy to allow these folks to um, sort of, you know, kick that around a little bit. Um, I do think, Josh, you had a few slides about how this thing was put together and the construction of that that you were going to share, so we'll absolutely leave a little time for that. Uh, maybe uh, I would just offer a, a couple comments about you know, from my perspective and sort of, uh, you know, how sort of my field of expertise, which is teaching contemporary sculpture and how that sort of intersected with this. This was an interesting, you know, a, a, you know, set of ideas for me because on the one hand, yes, yes, this is not Georgia, you know, this is not Italy, this is not China, this is not sort of Korea, this is, you know, like all of these places. And when an individual from 21st century contemporary Midwestern America decides to sort of pick up this imagery, like what does that actually mean now? And like, like, how do you do that or how do you sort of engage that? And in the course of our conversation, one of the, the, the discussions that Josh and I had frequently was, um, you know, how do you sort of elevate this or how do you sort of infuse this with, uh, with an authenticity, you know? And a dilemma that you have, obviously, is because there's so much D&D &D culture, you know, Dungeons and Dragons culture, uh, because there's a, a lot of stuff sort of, you know, that gets ripped off. And so most of the imagery and most of the content uh, that we see associated with this, I, you know, the, the icon of the dragon, it's actually very much in the kitsch realm. You know, it's very much about all this stuff that, that frankly, I don't want my students bringing and you know, bringing into the studio. It's like, like this is stuff that's not very authentic. It's we're removed from that, and and um, you know, and so part of the challenge I think as we started to work through this project together uh, was was kind of trying to think about this uh, a little bit more and a little bit more deeply. And, uh, you know, hence my insistence on historical sort of, you know, um, uh, research, you know, and that kind of contextualizing. I do think we have some really interesting models, though, because this schism between sort of like high art, low art, or sorry, kitsch and uh, sort of like authentic art. Um, you know, artists kind of do this, this weird thing where we, we love that tension between those two and we're constantly sort of moving back and forth, especially within a, you know, contemporary art goes clear back to Impressionism. Impressionism at, at its earliest stages was really snubbed by academia. You know, it's like us academics, we didn't like it because it wasn't informed, it wasn't smart, it didn't have all the right references, it was very visceral, it was very popular, and all those kinds of things. And you can see this kind of playing out again and again throughout Western art history that subjects that, that you know, were sort of snubbed by academia or subjects that were not valued, even, you know, sort of up to, you know, Andy Warhol's soup cans, you know, he started making those, you know, you know, 40, 50 years ago now. These were not sort of, you know, you know it's like, well, some people kind of got them, but a lot of people really didn't. Um, and uh, so on the one hand, while there may be sort of tensions there, on the other hand, as a maker, as an artist, um, you know, you, you kind of want to find those schisms. You want to kind of find those those chinks in the armor, so to speak, and exploit those and and use those because there's such great tension. There's some such great dialogues, um, and so the more that I started to sort of overcome my initial reservations uh, in this subject between sort of like kitsch and, and fine art and things like that, uh, the more interesting it got to me. And so thanks, Josh, for maybe changing my mind a little bit about that um, as we go. Uh, and this morning as I was thinking about, uh, you know, speaking a little bit about this as well, um, I was considering George Lucas, you know, and you know, here was a guy who just hoovered up massive amounts of this kind of content and information uh, as he started to put the Star Wars universe together. And, you know, it's like you can find examples of dragons and, you know, different, you know, chivalrous and, you know, he just would really sort of took a lot of these sort of archetypal <laughs> things. And that's kind of what I, you know, from my perspective, what uh, the two presentations we have seen so far have really been about is sort of, you know, dragon as archetype, dragon as, as a symbol of sort of larger idea in the Western culture. 
Um, you know, it's telling that in most depictions of the dragon, in you know, the examples that you show, you have the dragon who's emerging from the ground. You know, the ground and the earth and, and sort of the earthiness was not a friendly place in medieval Europe. You know, it was, it was you know, that's where the dark things live. Um, and so you have these symbols that, that kind of emerge. Uh, they, they become archetypes of, of different things. And one of the things that I have loved about sort of, you know, growing up with the, the Star Wars universe is, you know, when Star Wars first came out, you know, it was, I mean, it's fantastic. It's a great, it's a great world. And, and Lucas was so canny about the way that he leveraged all these stories and put all these things together. Um, and because it was so financially successful, like, he was just ripped off immediately by about 20 different people. And all of those are terrible. <laughs> um, and it's a really interesting study to me. It's like, why was Lucas so successful and all these other people were not? And I think, for me, the conversation is a lot about this back and forth between, like, how do you actually understand that? Because Lucas, like, really, he really got that. Like, he understood the samurai. He understood the dragon. He understood, like, what that means and how to, how to tell those stories and how to get inside those stories. You know, you don't just put a sword in somebody's hand and turn him into a samurai. You know, that just doesn't happen, which is what all these sort of second and third rate uh, versions did. And, um, you know, to me that starts to be an interesting model. It's like, how do you start to sort of understand this imagery or how do we start to understand this, um, you know, this transition from sort of pop art to high art and, and this back and forth, this slippage back and forth between these things uh, that we see kind of played out and which Joss is absolutely sort of participating in here. You know, it's like this image, this image in 21st century America is a super kitschy image. And yet, you know, going back and treating it with sensitivity, treating it with integrity uh, and from an informed stance, it starts to have a different kind of conversation about it. We start to understand it in a different way. So, so those are sort of my brief remarks about this. And we have uh, uh, 10 minutes or so left. Yeah, and absolutely, I think we might uh, leave time for a few questions, Josh, but maybe we want to, I think people are curious enough about construction that that would be good to see some of those images. So if you have any questions or if you want to know how it's made, I can go through that really quick. If that's interesting. Yeah? Okay, cool. So. Um, how did you build it? This is a quote from someone famous. <laughs> um, but anyway, so first, what was really important to me is the whole, like, the airy feeling that the Eastern dragons have. Um, I didn't want it to be, like, ground burden. I wanted it to have a very fluid form. And so um, in the process, it's a couple of modeling things. So this one was sort of the more formal, like, design. I wanted it to look like this. And it's all based off of that sarcophagus that I show you, I wanted to use that imagery um, and just present it well. Um, but then uh, for as far as movement goes, I did a rather quick one just to like get the construction and the shape of the form. And then I did have an armature so I could kind of figure out like what I wanted to do for stabilization. So this takes us down into the studio, the dark depths of creativity. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was my spot. I was like, I didn't want to be in the way, I didn't want to be intrusive. That didn't happen. Um, very intrusive, but it was a good time. So I started off with this wooden am amateur, and then I added the shape by using cardboard, and I just gradually built the form up. Um, and then just a lot of paper, a lot of hot glue, and I built the entire outer skin um, by working off of these ribs and like you just put paper, paper here and then you just fill in the gaps with more paper and then gradually you start to feel like the presence emerge. Like before that you're like, yeah, maybe, I don't know, this isn't working so well. But once you get to this stage, you're like, okay, now I can, now I can tweak this, now I can do some more figurative modeling. Um, and then color, like it's like a blank canvas until you get some color on there. Um, so I really, I really wanted this, this flowing of energy throughout the piece because that's how it's portrayed in art. There's several walls where like the dragon is just like, it's skewed all over and so much energy. Um, but I really wanted to use like most uh, Eastern dragons have this beard motif and they're highly, they almost have like, like facial hair. It's very interesting. Um, but then that carries where like the Western dragon will have like these really hard spikes 
it's more like a mane along the back, and that's what I was trying to capture. Um, so yeah, the spikes on the back are actually all hand carved, like out of foam. It took forever. Um, uh, would recommend, but uh, just know that it's going to create a mess. It's covered in pink fuzz for several, several days. Um, <laughs> but yeah, once you once you get a nice shine on them, they start to look good, and then. The scales and the plates on the bottom are actually pretty much all done the same way. Where I start off with a cardboard cutout and I'm taking this tissue paper and I'm folding it over and that creates, it gives it a shine. And then I was also playing with like the transparency of the material. Like you see this red color because I'm using red or an orange first and then I'm covering it with a yellow and those two layers laminated together creates this really interesting texture. So here was pretty close to the stage that I showed you. And it was like, I, from here, I took it in two days to completion. And um, I should have mentioned this earlier, but it is in three pieces. So we've got like a top section, which it inserts in the top and there's like a trough that holds it. And then this is like a linchpin. Um, so it's, it's like a trailer hitch where it like goes together and you stick a pin down. And so that was my hope of making it easier to transport it. I really wanted it to show up one day. Um, but actually, these segments do not fit well through hallways. So <laughs> note to self in the future. This piece right here, um, is what, it's 10, not, not 10 feet, it's probably like 9 feet. And so like navigating that through hallways was hard, and then this piece was just awkward because this section's tall, but then it also has the legs attached to it. So like, you should have seen, the, there was three guys and we carried this thing up here and we're just like, <laughs> like trying to get it through hallways without hurting anything, and it survived for the most part. There was only, there was only one major like, like thing that got broken off and I was like, oh, that's probably not good, but hey, it's still standing, so you know, no complaints. Uh, nothing structural, just, um, yeah. So this this was the home for the dragon. I kind of took up, like I said, like 20 square feet. Like this is my stuff. I had like two, three ladders, like three hot glue guns running all the time. It was great. People would come and be like, how much sleep have you gotten? Not a lot. Okay, <laughs> bye. And then they move on. Uh, yeah, but assembling it up in the library, uh, we brought the first two, the biggest pieces, like I said, this was so awkward because that just doesn't fit well anywhere. And yeah, we attached it here. Uh, and then we carried this thing up. And bam, we're here. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We have like five minutes. Do we have like any content questions or any other specific questions? <laughs> this is a really nuts and bolts question. How many hours? Um, <laughs> I lost track in the first week at like a hundred hours. I was just like, oh, okay. So I know what it was two months long oh, over a period of two months that it was constructed and just Towards the end, it was more like like eight hours a day were being put into it. Yeah. I know I'm way in the back. Um, so you said you started with George and the Dragon and the more Western uh, idea of a dragon. What motivated you to make the actual sculpture the sculpture more Eastern? Uh, just for the camera, the question was um, like I was impacted mainly by uh, Saint George and the Dragon, like what caused me to choose the Eastern Dragon over this. Um, so actually in the initial proposal, I wanted to do like a third of this size, like three dragons. And so I was gonna do two Eastern and, uh, no, two Western and one Eastern. The thoughts were to do it like all around campus. But then I met with Anne and she was like, you can do this, like one of these bigger. And I was like, I'm pretty familiar with the Western image. And I just wanted to maybe tap into something that I wasn't uh, as informed on. And also it was a really interesting discussion. Uh, this dragon, which to them is this protective, almost divine deity, 
like how do we respond to that in our in our Western tradition? You know, and I wasn't going to bring this up, but you did. So, but the, <laughs> the initial proposal was for three different sculptures, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and once you started this one, it just the scale just really sort of expanded on you. Um, as an instructor, I pretty much just stood back and let you completely paint yourself into a corner. Um, <laughs> it's like, I was the guardrails. Yeah, I think, I think he could probably get himself out of it, but I'm not really going to help him too much. So, there's learning in that. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Do you have any... Is there life beyond the library for this drag? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it might be ephemeral in the last moments of flame or destruction, <laughs> but um, the, the goal is to, to find it another home. I've talked to several libraries and Ann mentioned there's another library, but if you would like it, it's not <laughs> yours. <laughs> I'm just hoping that somebody will take it because it's brought so much delight oh, fun. to us mm -hmm. and to the community. I, I just wish you could have seen all the faces of the mm. people that came in. And, you know, mm. We're just yep. enraptured by it. So mm. I know that it would bring a lot of joy to someone. Mm. Thank you. Well, Ken and I, we, we were upstairs uh, when he, we were uh, mm. working through like the piece. And if you haven't, I recommend going up and viewing it from the second floor as well. But uh, when we were up there, we had some students come in. They're like, wow, look at this. And so we kind of mm -hmm. got the chance to ease job on them and see the yep. reaction firsthand. So that was very cool. Yeah. Um, oh. oh, please. Okay. please. When, you, when, when you mentioned it being ephemeral, especially with something so large and being uh, something designed for a specific space, uh, I'm imagining you haven't done anything this large before. So, like learning all of these things, what are some takeaways you have about the process of creating something large and something that might not be there forever? You know, when you put so much time into it. Um, so, actually, as a freshman in high school, I made a nine and a half foot tall robot for a sculpture class. And that's kind of when I knew I wanted to work large scale. Uh, it's been fun. Every class I've had with Ken, that, like, I make something bigger, so who knows what's going to happen next. But um, I'd say this is the first one that I've had to work with a large armature. And the, because I wanted it to appear one day, and people be like, whoa, there's a dragon. What's, how? It wasn't assembled anywhere. And so that's exactly the response I got. But it was a lot of, like, m like, measuring like okay I don't want this thing to like be awkward in like hallways which I actually did not measure the hallways should have done that um, but it luckily fits um, and so I would say the challenges that I've had with working with something this big um, it's it's ten and a half feet tall so you kind of have to use the ladder a bit more um, and that that was a little bit different because it has such a like the things I've done have been mainly like here's a front, here's a side, this piece, it, it intermingles and it intertwines and like, like working with that form, you want to keep it, you want to keep it fluid, but you still need to give it structure. And so playing with that and the material has been, has been interesting. Did I answer all the yeah. questions? Yeah. Okay. This is a huge accomplishment. I mean, this is absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now that you have this whole experience underneath your belt, how are you going to take it into the rest of your career? How am I going to take this experience into the rest of my career? Um, honestly, it just it gives me more motivation to go bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was it was such a fun project to work with at a large scale, and like like we said, like at a third of the size, like you like oh that's cool, but then you move on. Something this big, you begin to feel like oh, like, like dragons, like I believe in real, but you begin to believe that dragons like actually come to life. And so that's interesting to me where we're now shifting, like normally when we make sculptures, we're looking down on them, but now the dragon's looking down on us. So I really liked that relationship. And I think I'm gonna bring a lot of those ideas into the future way that I work. Good. Well. We're at the end of our time, so there's one quick thing. So, 
whenever a scientist discovers a, a creature, they get to name it. And, um, and so we have decided that, um, that the Vanasaurus by Josh Vanna is the official name for this creature. And um, Jim and I, as authentic dragon experts of some type, um, are deeding this to you, or sort of deeming this to be official. So, so thank you. Thank <laughs> you.